Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever it happens to be, wherever you are at. Welcome to Empty Cross Ministries Biblical Focal Points. And we are going through a study here on money, personal finances, God's way. We are up now to reaching the point of looking at the perils of money. Matthew 6.27 says, Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? Just as God uses money to enhance and direct our lives, Satan will use it to shackle us. Christians should learn to recognize the danger of money entanglements and financial bondage. What is bondage? Until recent times, financial bondage meant precisely that, physical bondage. If a man could not pay his debts, he was thrown into debtor's prison, and his family then belonged to the lender. In Scripture, we see the same practice enforced against debtors. Matthew chapter 5, verses 25 and 26 read, Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way, in order that your opponent may not deliver you to the judge and the judge to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Truly, I say to you, you shall not come out of there until you have paid up to the last cent. Physical bondage no longer exists, but it has been replaced by another that is equally bad, worry or mental bondage. Thousands of families each year are destroyed by financial worries caused by financial pressures or bondage. Why? Because they have violated one or more scriptural principles. It is not simply the lack of money that results in financial bondage. Many times an abundance will result in mental anguish. If there is too little, people worry about gaining more, and with too much, they worry about losing it. It is always attitude that is reflected in God's word, and that is what we are going to examine. Turn with me, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 and 9. And I'm going to turn there, too, so I can read it. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 and 9. If you go too far, you end up in the book of Isaiah. Okay. Here we are. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 and 9, beginning in verse 7. Two things I request of you, to deprive me not before I die. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me. Lest I deny, lest I be full and deny you, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. There are two principles that are discussed in this verse. I want you to fill in the blank on this one. The danger in riches is blank. Fill that in. The danger in poverty, the danger in poverty is blank. Fill in the blank there. The principle is clear when dealing with poverty, honesty versus dishonesty. But the distinction is not so clear with wealth. Why? We become content without God. What is God's attitude toward debt? There is much confusion regarding whether a Christian should borrow money. Our study will be directed to the biblical attitude about bondage. Let me first define debt or bondage. Debt is when someone has a delinquent financial obligation. Therefore, Money borrowed and repaid according to agreement is not a debt, but an obligation. However, bondage can also occur if other principles are violated, as we will see later. Bondage through debt. One of the most common causes of bondage is the abuse of credit. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7, and see what that says. <clears throat> Proverbs 22, verse 7, that says, 
the rich rules over the poor and the borrower and the borrower is servant to the leader the borrower becomes servant to the lender this principle should tell christians god's attitude toward delinquent debts <laughs> when someone borrows money beyond his normal ability to repay it is because he lacked the self-discipline to either save for the object or to deny himself a material desire. Now let's look at another one, indulgence. God speaks to the attitude, not the act. The fact that someone is in debt is the result of an earlier attitude. Uh, we're going to look at two uh, verses here. First we're going to go to Proverbs chapter 21 verse 17 and then we're going to go to the new testament and look at luke chapter 12 15 but let's look at proverbs 21 17 first because we are closer to it than the other that's why we're going to look at it first proverbs 21 verse 17 and that reads he who loves he who loves pleasure will be a poor man he who loves wine and oil will not be rich does this mean that God disallows any kind of pleasure or enjoyment? Can you think of a scripture that we've had used previously relating to this? Now this go to Luke chapter 12 verse 15. Clear back up in the New Testament. The Gospel of Luke chapter 12 verse 15. And it reads, And he said to them, Take heed and be aware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. What about avoiding debts? Is it scriptural? Is it scriptural to claim bankruptcy? It seems logical that if someone has incurred excessive debts and has a truly changed attitude, he should be able to start afresh, doesn't it? Let's look at, <clears throat> excuse me, let's go to Psalm 37, verse 21, and see what it says. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 37, verse 21. And it reads, The wicked borrows, and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. Let me read that again. Psalm 37, verse 21. The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. How is the wicked man described? He's described as one who borrows and does not repay. Now let's go to, back to Luke chapter 16, verse 12. Are you with me? Luke chapter 16, verse 12. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Now, what is God's principle of credit? I want you to think of that and come up with your own words for it. Is God's plan logical? In worldly terms, to avoid debtors seems logical. A common response of the borrower is, How will I live if they take everything? Well, let's go to Psalm 50, verses 14 and 15, and look at it. Back to the Psalms. Hey, and look what I found in, marked in my Bible. It is a check for $20. How about that? Okay. Where were, Psalm 50, verses 14 and 15. Yeah, we're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures. And we're going to be jumping all over the Bible here. <clears throat> I 
I didn't mark these down and I didn't write them down or have them already looked up because I want you to look them up with me and read them too so you know that I am telling you the truth about what God says about finances. I'm not making this stuff up, okay? This is what it says. I am reading from the new King James Version. You may be using a different version. The words might be different, but the meaning is going to be the same. Psalm 50, verses 14 and 15, and they read, Offer to God thanksgiving, and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Now, what does God promise? What does God promise in these verses? He says, I will deliver you in the day of your trouble. And what does he expect from us? He expects us to give him thanksgiving, to pay our vows to him, and call upon him in the day of our trouble. And he will deliver us, and he also expects us to glorify him. God always looks into the heart of a believer. As one reads in Genesis how God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, it becomes apparent that God asked him to surrender all, to surrender everything. God looked into his heart and saw a true commitment to his will. Abraham believed that if God could send him a son in his old age, he could surely retrieve his son from death. Thus God entrusted to Abraham his kingdom on earth. When Christians transfer assets simply to avoid detachment by creditors, it reflects a basic lack of trust and a deceitful attitude. Now, you know, we talked about, uh, the, we're talking about the perils of money here. And there can be bondage, financial bondage through wealth. Financial bondage can also exist through an abundance of money. Those who, who, those who use their money for self-satisfaction or hoard it for the elusive rainy day that never comes also are bound. The accumulation of wealth and the physical possession of money can become an obsession that will destroy health, family, and friends. Suddenly, everything and everybody becomes an object to be used in the ladder of success. Let's look at Job chapter 31, verses 24 and 25. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Job. Almost there. It is. Okay. For Job chapter 31. And the pages in my Bible are stuck, stuck together for some reason. Chapter 31, verses 24 and 25. Then I'm finally there in my Bible. That's on page 888, verses 24 and 25. And they read, If I have made gold my hope, or said to find gold, you are my confidence. If I have rejoiced because my wealth was great, and because my hand had gained much. Okay, what was Job stressing as the danger in having riches? Let's read those again. 24 and 25. If I have made gold my hope, or said to find gold, you are my confidence. You know what? That doesn't really answer the question here, does it? Job chapter 31, verses 24 and 25. And that's what I am reading. Okay. Okay, the questions are, what was Job stressing as a danger in having riches? What lesson can we learn about wealth and attitude? Okay, this attitude is not confined to non-Christians. Many Christians fall into Satan's snare 
and convert the very resource that God provided for their peace and comfort into something full of pain and sorrow. As we noted earlier, God does not condemn wealth. He condemns the misuse of wealth. We will evaluate different characteristics of the perils of money. Some are brought about by too little money, some by too much, but in either case, attitude is the key. In order to find God's financial solutions, it is necessary to assess the problem. Too many times we treat symptoms rather than problems as, previous, as we previously discussed. Circumstances are merely symptoms of an earlier wrong attitude. A Christian can assess whether a problem attitude exists if any of the following symptoms apply. What about overdue bills? Anxiety, frustration, and worry are produced when family bills cannot be paid. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27, and see what it says. So if you turn with me there to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27. And it reads, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, when it is in the power of your hand to do so. Now, let's look at Proverbs 3.28. And see what the Lord's direction is. Do not say to your neighbor, Come, go and come back, and tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. This principle is God establishing a pay as you go system. Okay? What about worry about investments? This may not involve this may involve not only investments but also savings and anything else that diminishes a Christian spiritual faith. Let's go to Matthew 6, 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, and see what it says. And it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, and love the other, or else you will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. <clears throat> God condemns the misuse of money. God condemns the allegiance to money, not as possession. God wants him God wants to be first in your life. Anything else should come after God, especially money. But God worries about our attitude towards money. Evaluate Luke 9.25. Let's go and do that. Luke chapter 9.25. Matthew, Mark, Luke. <laughs> Luke 9, verse 25. And it reads, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? I think that's pretty self-explanatory there. Do you sense the same attitude in Christ's words? A get-rich-quick attitude. This attitude is not one of application as much as motivation. In other words, it is not so much what you do as to why you do it. It's the primary motivation, work for gain or profit without effort. God establishes two promises in Proverbs 28.20. Let's look at those. Proverbs 28.20. Would you turn with me there? Proverbs chapter 28, verse 20. Are you almost there? I am. Okay, Proverbs 28, 20 reads, A faithful man will, will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. 
What does the faithful man, what does this proverb say about the faithful man? It says he will abound with blessings. What does it say about the hasty man? It says he will never be rich. Let me read that verse again. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Okay. Laziness. What about laziness? God specifically condemns the attitude, this attitude, and establishes guidelines for other Christians to follow in the relationships with him. Proverbs 21 verses 25 through 26, 26 describes his foolish attitude. Let's go look at Proverbs 21, verses 25 and 26. And they read, The desire of a lazy man kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. He covers he covets greedily all day long, but the righteous gives and does not spare. How does God tell us to treat those who will not work? Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. I'm sure we are, are all familiar with that verse, but let's go look at it anyway. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. And I jumped clear up into Timothy. I need to go back one. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. It says, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. So how does God tell us to treat those who will not work? It says, don't feed them. Now, remember, this means those who will not work, not those who cannot work. There is a big difference, okay? We are to help those who cannot work, but those who will not work and are fully capable of doing it, we are not to even feed them. They are he will not he who will not work, neither shall he eat. That's simple as it can be. What about deceitfulness? That refers not only to purposely lying to others, but also not being entirely open and honest. Our society seems to believe one cannot be both successful and honest. That is another lie promoted by Satan. Let's go to Proverbs 19.1 and let's see what God equates a lie with. Proverbs chapter 19 verse 1. And it reads, Better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one who is perverse in his lips and is a fool. So God equates a liar to being a fool. There are no little or white lies at God's evaluation. God makes a promise to those who deal deceitfully in Proverbs 20 verse 17. Let's look at that. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 17. It reads, Bread gained by deceit is as sweet to a man. Is sweet. Let me read that again. Bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man, but afterward his mouth will be filled with gravel. What does the afterward refer to? Could that be a guilty conscience maybe? What about the attitude of greediness? An attitude of consistently desiring more than is presently owned or always wanting the best characterizes greed. Let's look at Job 21 verse 17. And see what that says about this. Job chapter 1, chapter 21. Job chapter 21, verse 17. And it says, How often is the lamp of the wicked put out? How often does their destruction come upon them? 
the sorrows God distributes in his anger. What is the reward of the wicked? It is sorrow. That's what it is. And let's go look at Luke twelve fifteen. Let's jump back up to the New Testament now and look at Luke twelve fifteen. I know we're covering a lot of scriptures here. And we're going to get to the fun part here in a moment. <clears throat> of actually getting to the mechanics of setting up a budget. Luke chapter 12, 15. And it reads, And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And that is Christ's admonition here. Beware of covetousness. Desiring that which someone else has is most frequently promoted by the advertising media as keeping up with the Joneses. Okay. And there are several verses to cover that. Uh, we're not going to go look at them, but you can look them up later. Psalm 73, verses 2 through 3, they describe this condition. And God's directive is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Okay. And if there, you want to look up more, I would, matter of fact, next time we'll pick up more. Uh, maybe do a little bit of supplemental study on the attitudes here towards money. You have money entanglements, self-indulgence, financial superiority, and financial resentment. But we want to get to setting up the budget now, the fun part. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. First of all, you have to determine your monthly income and expenses. Where you are. We already did that. We, where you're at now, we did a net worth statement last time. If you had a positive number, fantastic, but your number could always be better. You can always improve on that. If you have a negative number, fear not. You are not alone. Okay, I'm going to upload some things to the Empty Cross Ministries Facebook page. And you can look at these forms and fill them out from there. And I have some examples on the income and stuff like that. Uh, just fill in what yours actually is. On the monthly income and expense form, you want to compare the actual monthly expenses with monthly income to determine what your present spending is. I would recommend that you keep a diary of expenses for a few months before you actually can determine what your actually monthly expenses are. Take a notebook with you. When Anytime you buy something, write it down and how much you paid for it. What you bought, how much you paid for it. Okay? It's gonna, it will probably take uh, one to two, maybe even three months to get an accurate picture of what you're spending. If you buy a candy bar or a can of soda pop out of the machine at work, write it down. If you buy a pack of gum at the gas station, write it down. Okay. If you fill up your gas tank and you buy a soda pop, a candy bar, a pack of gum, and a pair of sunglasses, write it all down and how much you actually spent. Okay. <clears throat> to determine the living costs, you need to consider what, re what represents a reasonable standard of, li of living at your present income level. Reasonable, not total. Sacrifices will be necessary. Therefore, when you set up this budget, you need to include a reasonable amount for personal spending, for clothes, savings, entertainment, recreation, those kinds of things. Okay, what you want to do is list all your gross income. That's everything before anything's taken out. Okay, you want to put that in the income per month section on the monthly income and expenses sheet. And I will upload that to the Empty Cross Ministries Facebook page, okay? And you'll get it there. Okay, you don't, on your income, don't forget to include any commissions you get, any bonuses you get, any tips you have, any interest you've earned that will be received over the next 
12 months, when income consists totally or partially of commissions or other fluctuating sources, you need to average it for a year and divide it by 12. And you want to use a low yearly average, not a high yearly average. If you are paid on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, take the total yearly income and divide it by 12, and that gives you your monthly income. Business expense reimbursements should not be considered family income. Avoid the trap of using expense money to buffer family spending, or the result will be an indebtedness that cannot be paid. Now, what is net spendable income? Net spendable income is that portion available for family spending. Some of your income does not belong to the family and therefore cannot be spent. For instance, the first category on the sheet is the tithe. Since the term tithe means a tenth, I will assume that you give 10% of your total income to God. Okay. Second category is the taxes. Your federal withholding, social security, state, local taxes, and whatever else they take out is deducted from the gross income. Self-employed individuals must not forget to set aside money for quarterly prepayments on taxes. Beware of the tendency to treat unpaid tax money as windfall profits. There's other deductions. You might have payroll deductions for your health insurance, your credit union savings or debt payments, any uh, savings bond that you buy or stock programs, maybe retirement, and maybe even if you belong to a union, your union dues. These can be handled in one of two ways. Treat them as a deduction from gross income, the same as the income taxes, where you can include them in spendable income and deduct them from the proper category. This is preferred because it provides a more accurate picture of where the money is actually being spent. A deduction is being made. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself here. So your net spindle income equals your gross income minus the tithe and minus your taxes. Now, how is your net spendable income being spent? Okay. Again, I've got this set up in categories. Category 1 is the tithe. Category 2 is taxes. Category 3 is your housing expenses. All monthly expenses necessary to operate your home, including taxes, insurance, maintenance, and utilities. The amount used for utility payments should be an average monthly amount for the past 12 months. If you cannot establish an accurate maintenance expense, use 5% of the monthly mortgage payment. Okay? The fourth category is food expenses at your groceries. Okay? These include paper goods and non-food products normally purchased at grocery stores. Like I said, though, only buy food at the grocery store. Okay? You can get those paper products and the cleaning products and the personal hygiene products a lot cheaper at the discount stores like uh, Dollar General, Family Dollar Value Stores, and uh, Big Lots, places like that. Okay? It's the same stuff. It's just a whole lot cheaper there than it is at the grocery store. Okay. And category five is your automobile expenses. This includes your payments, your insurance, the gas, the oil, the maintenance, and any depreciation. Depreciation is actually a money set aside to repair or replace the automobile. The minimum amount set aside should be sufficient to keep the car in decent repair and to replace it at least every four to five years. If replacement funds are not available in the budget, the minimum allocation should be maintenance cost. Annual or semi-annual auto insurance payments should be set aside on a monthly basis, thereby avoiding the crisis of a neglected expense. I found it's a whole lot easier, though, to pay that car insurance monthly. Because what happens is you have a crisis every six months. Oh, no, the car insurance is due this month. And you don't have it because you didn't set it aside. At least that's what's happened to me. So I pay it every month, and it's built right into the budget. Category 7 is the debts. This You will include all monthly payments that you make to meet your debt obligations. Your mortgage and your car payments are not included here. We don't count. You have to have a place to live and anymore in today's society you have to have a car to drive. So we don't count those as debts. Those are, ne those are necessities. Okay, so they are covered in the other categories. Now we come to your entertainment and recreation. Your, whatever you want to set aside, this is category 8. 
whatever you want to set aside for vacations, camping trips, any club dues you have, any sporting equipment that you want to buy, any hobbies that are expensive that you have, and the athletic events, the sporting events that you want to go to. And what about the, you have kids that are in Little League or booster clubs and those kinds of things. This is where you want to record those expenses. It's in Category 8. The Category 9, we have clothing. The average annual spend on clothing divided by 12. The minimum amount should at least be $10 per month per family member. That means if you have a family of four, you should be putting at least $40 a month in this category for clothing. If you don't, someone's going to need shoes, someone's going to need a shirt, someone's going to need a suit for something, so you need to set that aside, okay? Put that money in this category. Now, category 10 is savings. Every family should allocate something for savings. A savings account can provide funds for emergency and is a key element in good planning and financial freedom. This is category 10. But you know what? This is where you need to put the money before you pay anything else. You need to pay yourself first. Put 10% into your savings account. However you're doing that, 10% needs to go in there. Okay. Then we have category 11. Medical expenses, your insurance deductibles, your doctor's bills, your glasses, your drugs, prescription and over-the-counter drugs, any dentist visits you have, you want to use your yearly average and divide it by 12 to determine the monthly amount that should be in there. Now, we come to category 12. My favorite category is miscellaneous. Specific expenses that do not seem to fit anywhere else. Your pocket allowance, like coffee money, uh, these uh, miscellaneous gifts that came to come, seem to come around, Christmas presents, uh, your personal hygiene products, your haircuts, that kind of stuff, need to go in this category. Miscellaneous spending is usually underestimated. A 30 to 40, 30 to 45 day spending record is usually necessary to establish accurate present spending habits. Self-discipline is the key to controlling miscellaneous spending. And we have a few more categories here. And we're getting close to running out of time here. Category 13 is school and child care. Okay, any money you spend on daycare or school projects, that kind of stuff, needs to go in category 13. And category 14 is investments. Individuals and families with surplus income in their budget will have the opportunity to invest for retirement or other long-term other long -term goals. A debt-free status is achieved. More money can be diverted to this category. And then we have a one last category. It's 15. It's unallocated surplus income. And we'll talk about that next time. We've only got a few minutes left. Okay, so here we go. Income versus expenses. Step one, compile the expenses under each of the major categories. And note this as the total expense. Then, in the space provided, and there's a space on the sheet, subtract expenses from net spendable income. Step two, if income is greater than expenses, you need only to control spending to maximize a surplus. And we'll get to how you can do that later. Step three, if expenses are greater than income, you need to do a detailed analysis to correct the situation to restore a proper balance. Now, who are you? Do you have an income that's greater than expenses? Or are your expenses greater than your income? Again, I'm going to upload uh, the monthly income and expense sheet with the categories that are on there up to Empty Cross Ministries' Facebook page. Go there, like the page, and you can uh, download the... You can download this sheet from there. So that is it for today, and stay tuned. We'll be back tomorrow with uh, some short-range planning, and we're going to talk about how to get out of financial servitude, how to get out from under the perils of money. Stay safe, be blessed, and stay in the Word. And we're going to close out with a song. I like this one. It's in Navajo, and that's a beautiful language, and the music is beautiful. We've got just enough time to play it. It's called Haya. I can't even pronounce it. I'm not even going to try. Beautiful song, though. And the last part is in English. <laughs> 